Hi, everybody. And wow, thanks for that great uh, energizing talk. Um, I am going to talk to you in a moment about the hardest problems in computer science. But forewarning, I'm going to ask you to actually talk to each other in the middle of this talk. So if you hadn't had a chance to meet the people you're sitting near yet, please take a moment to say hi. Um, and in case anyone is not comfortable or cannot communicate verbally and would like a notepad, I've scattered a few of them throughout. If anyone needs one, just raise your hand and you can have this. Thanks very much to our sponsors, ThoughtWorks and Devonda, for these. Okay, so my name is Anjana Vakil. I am a software developer based here in Berlin. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Anjana Vakil. And no media restrictions, so feel free to tweet your hearts out. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about the hardest problems in computer science. Very serious. You may have heard that there are two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things, and off by one errors. <laughs> I can't take credit for this. Uh, it's been passed around through a lot of hands. It's generally originally attributed to Phil Carlton. But and now these are, these are technical problems, and it's true, they are hard. Uh, perhaps we've run into them, any of us who are uh, programmers. But I think that they're also very hard problems when it comes to diversity and inclusion in the tech and computer science space. So what I'd like to do today is to have a conversation with you all about what these problems mean when, a, when considered in the light of diversity and inclusion, why they're so hard, and hopefully what we can do to go about solving them as uh, individuals and as a community all together. So let's start with cache invalidation. Uh, what are we talking about here? Well, Cache invalidation generally has to do with trying to improve the performance of your application. Let's say uh, you want users to have a fast experience loading your web app, so the first time they download some data, you'll cache it locally so that the next time they try to access the same data, it happens faster. But that data goes stale. Something changes on your website, and the user has a cache that's no longer uh, accurately representing reality of your site. So that data in the cache uh, needs to be invalidated, needs to be removed. And this is kind of something that happens to us as people as well. We have something sort of like a caching mechanism. Um, Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman wrote this best-selling book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, and he describes two systems that we use for making decisions as humans. Um, one of them is very fast, very performant, but it's based on uh, intuitions, emotions, heuristics that aren't necessarily accurate representations of reality. So system one can make very fast decisions, which is super useful when you're like being chased by a predator in the woods as an evolutionary being. But it means that the decisions you make aren't necessarily the best ones, aren't necessarily uh, based on assumptions that are logical or truthful. We do have a second system, which is logical, more deliberative, perhaps uh, better enabled to give us an accurate picture of reality, but that one is really slow, not performant at all. So we tend not to use it as much as we would like to think that we do. So how does this affect our uh, lives in the tech world? Well, really quick, picture a software engineer in your head. Okay, I don't know what you have in your head. I know what I have in my head, and even though I am a software engineer, it doesn't really look a lot like what I see in the mirror even though I know tons of software engineers that look more like me than the stereotypical picture that I have in my head. Unfortunately, a lot of other people also have these kind of stereotypical images in their head. Recently, Ola Gazidlo, who's also a Berlin-based engineer for Mozilla, tweeted that at uh, border security, she was told, you are not an engineer, you are too pretty for that. Because apparently someone had a cached image of a software engineer that didn't include being pretty or looking like her. That's invalid. We need to check that out. We need to re-download uh, re our representations of what people in the world of tech and computer science especially, but also generally, look like or behave like or dress like. So what can we do about this? Well, uh, Sailor Mercury in a blog post on Medium called Coding Like a Girl, which I believe was also an AlterConf talk, gives a really great piece of advice. She says, Instead of assuming what someone's position or career is, ask. Ask politely, and don't act surprised at the answer. 
Now, not acting surprised is a crucial element here, almost as crucial as asking instead of assuming. The Recurse Center is a fabulous, inclusive programming community in New York City. I was lucky enough to participate in it in 2015. And they have a set of social rules that try to keep the space safe and welcoming for anyone from any walk of life who's trying to become a better programmer. One of their rules, which I love, is called no feigning surprise. Feigning surprise is this thing. Maybe you've encountered it. Maybe you've done it. We all probably have. It's when someone says that they don't know what some technical concept is, let's say cache and validation, and someone else says, what? You don't know what cache and validation is? Oh my god, that is the most shocking piece of information I have ever received in my entire life. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be that shocking. It shouldn't be shocking at all. And even if you are actually surprised, don't show it. Don't act surprised. Just say, Cache invalidation is blah, 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 and then they know, and then you know that they know, and everybody knows, and everybody learns, and everybody's happy. Simple. So, those are a couple of solutions. What solutions might you have? This is where I would love for everyone to take one minute and chat with your neighbors. Do you have any experience with this issue? Any ideas how we can help solve this problem? Go. Oh, come on, you want to be friends, make new friends. If you don't feel comfortable talking, just use this moment to think about it yourself. Okay. Awesome. So, I hate to cut the conversations off because I see and hear a lot of engagement. That's fantastic. Great that we have more breaks coming up later where we can continue that conversation. Um, but for now, let's move on to the next problem naming things or people. Uh, so in a study of uh, computer source code, software source code, Dysonbok and Pitska uh, researchers found that the majority of source code, about 70%, consists of identifiers, names for concepts. And they come to the conclusion that, therefore, the names that we choose to identify these things in our code are of the paramount importance for the readability of that code, the comprehensibility, uh, for, for being able to reason about it. And yet, how often do we come across names like this in, let's say, code examples, documentation? This is a, this is Python syntax, but it doesn't matter. I'm defining a function. It's called foo. Uh, I have a string, hello world, and I'm assigning that to a variable called bar, and then I'm printing bar. Foo, bar, do these names mean something? No, they're often used in uh, introductory examples to stand in for kind of any function, any variable. However, that sort of assumes that you've somehow become familiar with the use of these strange little words to mean an, any function that you want, any variable that you want. Now, that, that's already making, this is kind of relating back to the cache invalidation example, that's already making an assumption that you have some familiarity with these known nonsense terms. When I was starting to learn to code, I remember being so confused by the examples in my introductory uh, programming textbook because I, I was like, am I missing something? Am I supposed to know what that means? It doesn't mean anything to me. What's happening here? And so this is one way in which uh, names actually in our programs can be exclusionary in a way that perhaps we're not thinking enough about. But it's not just the names of things in our code. It's actually names of coders themselves that also matter a lot. In a rather disturbing, I think, study called Gender Differences and Bias in Open Source, um, researchers Terrell et al. found that women uh, contributing to open software projects on GitHub were considered better coders in the sense that their pull requests were accepted more often if their profile used a gender neutral or non-gender identifiable handle, if they had a username which was not identifiable as a feminine name. On the other hand, if they had an identifiably female name, their pull requests were accepted less often than males. So it doesn't matter just what your code says. It also matters what your name says when you're presenting that code. This I find problematic. I think a lot of other people do too. So what can we do about these naming issues? Well, the code one is pretty simple to fix. Just use names that actually describe the things that they're talking about. If I have a string called hello world and I want that to be a greeting, 
and uh, this function is supposed to greet the user, I can call it greet user instead of foo. I can call the variable greeting instead of bar. These are self-explanatory names. That means they're more inclusive. They're not making assumptions about the background of people approaching this source code. And as for the uh, username issue, well, a lot of folks are tempted to change their name or use a, a more neutralized name. And so far, we've just been talking about gender, but of course, this could apply to if your name has an identifiable ethnicity or is identifiably from a certain region, you might be tempted to uh, neutralize it or whitewash it such that you would have better uh, reception of the code that you're presenting. However, I think um, GitHub contributor and software developer and fellow Recurse alum, Heather Booker, uh, makes a good point when she says that continuing to publicly present as a woman or whatever your identity is, is important for solidarity. It's important to be identifiable to other members of your same group who might also feel excluded in that community. And that's gonna tie into our last point, which we'll look at in a moment. But for now, let's take another uh, break from our sponsors, you, <laughs> to, uh, to exchange some ideas about this one. Take one minute. All righty. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for participating in this discussion. And for those of you not, not uh, feeling like participating in the discussion, again, totally legitimate. Uh, hopefully, this gives you a moment to reflect. All right. Um, I hope we've got some good ideas floating around. I know I would love to hear them later, especially when it comes from GitHub handles and things, because I'm always feeling like I need to change mine. But um, for now, let's move on to the last problem, off by one errors. Uh, in the technical sense, this problem is sometimes uh, highlighted with a little riddle like this. You want a fence 30 meters long with fence post space three meters apart. How many posts do you need for your fence? If you thought 10, because 30 divided by 3 is 10, you are in really good company. That's what I thought when I first read this. But I was forgetting that each 3 meter section needs one post on either side, so that means the last one needs an extra one. So 11. Off by one errors. They happen all the time. My code's full of them. Don't tell my boss. <laughs> I have a version of this riddle I'd like to present to you. You want an engineering tier with diversity, with diverse members. How many of those diverse members do you need? <laughs> Trick question. There is no such thing as a diverse member. There's only diversity within the group. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of companies seem to have uh, this off by one error in their hiring practices where they think that if they have one member that's different from everyone else who is homogenous, that that somehow makes it a diverse team. However, this is problematic. As engineer Kelly Ellis pointed out, um, <coughs> Lack of diversity has a snowball effect. This should be obvious. No woman wants to be the first one on a team of 30 men. And this applies to all other groups where you don't want to be the first, the, the only X on a group of 30 Ys at all. This is a, unfortunately a situation that many of us in the tech world find ourselves in. I happen to be uh, the only woman on my team and I, when I was hired I was the only woman employed uh, by my company in an engineering role. And it's not that fun. One becomes hyper aware. Um, and this uh, was also an experience that Gloria Kimbala had. She's an engineer at Square. And uh, she recalls that in university, uh, my path through technology and through computer science, I was always very aware. I was the only minority and the only woman in all of my classes. This is something that uh, when one feels the odd one out, one becomes hypersensitive, hyper aware of one's different status. And this is problematic for things like stereotype threat. Stereotype threat, uh, my friend Khalid defined very succinctly last week at JSConf. Uh, he defined it as when people are in a situation where they feel at risk of conforming to a negative stereotype about their social group. So this is the kind of thing where you're afraid by being the only X that any mistake you make or any negative judgment that the people around you make about you is going to reflect not just on you as a person and as an individual, but on your entire group, whether that be your gender, your ethnicity, your uh, sexual orientation, whatever the, the different factor is, you're afraid that that negative judgment is gonna come at not only you, but everyone in your group. 
And this can be really uh, a crippling kind of uh, weight on someone when they're trying to go about their daily job. So what can we do about this type of off by one error? Well, um, we talked about solidarity a little bit earlier where uh, a GitHub contributor said it's important for people to identify what group they're in so that others can notify them. And this is, comes up again in a tweet by Amy Nguyen, who's an engineer at Pinterest. She proposes a mental health Bechdel test for women in male-dominated fields. Have I talked to another woman today about something related to my work? I don't know about all of you. And again, we can replace woman with uh, my group. I don't know about you, but I have a very hard time finding days when I can positively answer to this question. It's important, however, that we find each other, that we find people in our same group doing what we do, whether that be uh, in our company or, if that's not possible, online, in communities, in Slack channels, at conferences like this. It's really important that you find those people so that you don't have those feelings of isolation. However, there's only so much that an individual in the uh, odd one out position can do. The community as a whole also has to do something about this. And as Christina Sass, CEO of Andela, points out in TechCrunch, there's a simple solution to text gender imbalance. Hire more damn women. And again, we could look at this from any other diversity um, spectrum as well. She, uh, in this article, lays out some very concrete, very uh, practical strategies for how she achieved very ambitious diversity goal targets uh, in her hiring at her company. So, uh, we still have a couple of minutes. So, time for another break. Time for more getting to know your neighbors. <laughs> okay. Awesome. I really enjoy hearing all this lively chatter. Unfortunately, I've been standing up here this whole time and I haven't really been able to make out any individual ideas from y'all. So I'm wondering, would anyone like to share perhaps one idea that's come up in conversation of any of these three problems uh, today that they thought was um, particularly good, particularly worth sharing? Any takers? Okay, great. I'm just gonna try to repeat that. So uh, one is to set goals that are better than the overall diversity in the industry and achieve those. Excellent aim. And the second one is to take uh, existing role models in the community and uh, when they are uh, women or perhaps from other underrepresented groups to make that visible so that uh, everyone in the community identifies them as being from an underrepresented group. And the example was um, Sandy Metz from the Ruby community. Excellent, thank you for, for sharing. Yeah. Uh, we had an interesting conversation about hiring you know, more women and that companies often are just poaching women from other companies, that there's this problem of like, maybe there's not enough women to hire. And the answer to that, or one answer is, as a community, we should be generating more women engineers. And Rails Girls uh, is an amazing program for that, that the whole community uh, is behind. Thank you, awesome. I will also add the Closure Bridge community to that, as we've got some organizers here. Another great initiative, teaching women to code with Closure. All right, thank you so much for sharing all of your thoughts. Um, I th hope this has been a productive discussion. I know it has been productive for me. Again, I'm Anjana Vakil. You can find me on Twitter or you can come grab me afterwards. And thank you so much for participating.